Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays. My name is Francesca D'Alessio, and I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome independent ceramic artist and scholar, Michelle Erickson. Erickson's unique approach to ceramic arts blends traditional colonial era techniques with contemporary social, political, and environmental themes, creating a unique expression. Tonight, we learn more about Michelle Erickson's philosophy and process. Following the presentation, please join us for Q&A facilitated by Thomas Wu, our curatorial assistant of European decorative arts and sculpture. Please drop any questions you might have in the chat. Please give a warm welcome to Michelle Erickson and Thomas Wu. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Thomas Wu and I am the curatorial assistant for European decorative arts and sculpture at the Fine Arts Museums. Thank you very much for joining us this evening for a behind the scenes look at the exhibition Michelle Erickson Wild Porcelain on view in the Bulls Porcelain Gallery at the Legion of Honor. We are joined by the artist herself, Michelle Erickson, who will offer insight into the exhibition, her creative process and her distinguished career. Michelle is a ceramic artist and scholar based in Virginia. She holds a BFA from the College of William and Mary, and her work employs 18th century ceramic techniques to convey 21st century social and political narratives, and has added contemporary color to the collections of Colonial Williamsburg, the Victoria and Albert Museum, and the New York Historical Society, among others. Michelle's scholarship on colonial era ceramic techniques has been widely published, notably in the annual journal Ceramics in America. In 2007, she was commissioned to produce an official gift for Her Majesty the Queen during her state visit to Jamestown, Virginia. Michelle has also designed ceramics for the motion picture, The Patriot, and the HBO series, John Adams. She was an artist in residence at the Victoria and Albert Museum in 2012, and her recent exhibitions include, among others, Potter's Field at the Clay Arts Center in 2014, Conversations in Clay at the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art in 2015, and the traveling exhibition Insightful Clay from 2014 to 2017. This is a small sample of Michelle's projects and achievements. For Wild Porcelain at the Legion of Honor, Michelle drew design inspiration from pieces in the Bulls Porcelain Collection, in the Bulls Collection of 18th century English porcelain, which forms the core of the Fine Arts Museum's ceramic collection. However, Michelle's creations incorporate Bay Area landmarks, such as the Transamerica Pyramid and the Painted Ladies, and address pressing social and political issues, such as socioeconomic inequality, corporate power, gun violence, and climate change. I now hand the event over to Michelle, uh, and I, I know you will all enjoy hearing from her. Thank you, Thomas, and uh, thank you uh, everyone who's joining in. Nice to almost sort of virtually be with you all. And I um, just wanted to take a second to thank um, uh, a couple of people for the opportunity for this exhibition project and um, uh, a short video, which we'll see in a bit. Um, I'm in my studio right now. So uh, uh, the Ceramics in America that uh, Thomas just mentioned, the series is back here behind me and all kinds of other things. Um, but I wanted to thank um, the, the um, Constance Peabody Trust for their um, patronage of this um, project and uh, Philip and Jamie Bowles for uh, being supportive of uh, my work and interested in having uh, this, this conversation. And uh, Martin Chapman, the curator, and Thomas, of course, for their uh, help uh, with this collaboration. So, why clay is a, is a pretty big question and we'll, I'll try to answer that um, throughout this, this discussion. But um, the, the history of ceramics and the history of us uh, is so intertwined that ceramics became uh, my medium 
uh, some 30 years ago now uh, when I was uh, really a fine arts uh, student at the College of William Mary. And um, someone's approach to the material of clay can tell you a lot about that person, pots and people go uh, have ancient connection. And um, I think we'll delve into that as we go. And I thought I would just wanted to, to show um, some reasons that um, clay can be very revealing about, about who we are uh, and why we do the things we do. Gentle, Donald, slowly, okay? That's good. How much you want for your buck? 500, 600. Introducing Cozone.com, the place to find computer help and buy what's right for you. No idea Cozone.com, we can help. So I like to show that video. It's become um, a little more scary than funny these days to me, but um, I remembered it from years ago. And uh, in 2015, when uh, Trump was starting to, to uh, talk about running for president uh, or beginning his run for president, I searched high and low and, and found that because it always struck me um, even back then, but it sometimes matters um, to know uh, how to do what uh, you're doing. And so a lot of my work does involve delving into um, a broad range of, of uh, ceramic processes and the rediscovery of lost ceramic processes and that's um, something that informs it's my practice and my contemporary art. So the, the integrity of the objects themselves, the, the creation of them, and the, all the technical aspects of those is something I explore along with the, concession, the conceptual aspects of what I'm trying to um, create as a narrative. So I think they're going to um, show a video that we made as part of this project. Um, I wanted to thank Sean Johnson, who was the videographer and also did the drone video for this, for this short video that just kind of takes us inside my studio for a little bit of, of how I work and um, what some of the things that went into this project. Clay is just so, it's so basic, it's so ancient, and at the same time, it's a material that will be used to make something we haven't even conceived of yet. Literally stick your hand in the ground and pull out a piece of material that you then can shape into a creation and then put that creation in a fire. And then it, it changes it and it will never go back to what it was. My name is Michelle Erickson. I'm a ceramic artist working in the Colonial Triangle of Virginia. And my, I'm in my studio in Hampton, which is also the place where I grew up. It's a place that has a rich, complex, significant history that I didn't really become aware of until I started to become interested in ceramics, but predominantly English ceramics. My passion for clay as a medium sort of collided with the rich resource of colonial American archeological ceramics. That became a career long fascination 
fragments of pottery and porcelain from British, European, Asian, Native American, and enslaved African makers unearthed in these colonial excavations embody a remarkable convergence of cultures in clay. In 2019, I received an intriguing invitation from the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco to explore and respond to the Bowles Porcelain Gallery with my ceramic art. There was just so many different techniques and uses of the material. Beautiful, elegant, figurals and depictions of flora and fauna and all the kinds of things that sort of like artfully organize the natural world and bring it into the interior. I felt like I wanted to sort of turn that upside down a little bit. Understanding those things through the processes and through the objects and through their the material culture and how that connects to our present moment. The surprises of clay, that, that's where it all lies. I'm using the opportunity of this upcoming wood fire kiln in North Carolina to make some maquette-like models that are the kind of inspiration for the main works. Creating them out of the wild clay and then subjecting them to the, to the wood fire and this clay is a naturally occurring high temperature porcelainous clay that is not very conducive to throwing or hand modeling. In essence, my use of this porcelain clay forced me to use methodologies that were very similar to the 18th century British porcelain manufacture of the pieces represented in the Bowles collection. You just don't know what to expect. When Greta Thunberg gave her speech at the UN, I immediately started to see her as a 21st century version of a very famous bow porcelain bust of a laughing child. Speaking literally to, to the world leaders in the way that she did, it was such a stark difference of a young child, really, who is in fear that the world is going to perish. It was a moment in history that was so significant. You know, it immediately spoke to me in a series of work that I do. I've been able to look to the past to see historical moments that are captured in the medium of clay. Maybe I have a ability to recognize it when it's happening. It's not just my opinion about something. It's something that really I have to feel is connected to our shared past. Objects made out of clay that are fired, it's a record of humanity. It's a record that just doesn't break down. It's a way of knowing so much about where we've come from and who we are. My now 30-year practice in the rediscovery of lost ceramic arts has inspired a depth of historical reference and a technological virtuosity that gives my ceramic art a unique voice. It's not that I'm expecting an outcome from it. I just feel compelled to do it. So my interest in uh, clay as a material began really before my exposure to um, historical ceramics. 
Um, and because I'm from the Colonial Triangle of Virginia there, I came to know that there is an enormous amount of um, archeological material, ar uh, ceramic archeology span in this area. Um, this dish is a, well, 1661 English Delft tin glazed earthenware. And it just, it captures so much of what uh, I feel compels me about the medium of clay. And I felt like it also is something that says so much to our present moment as much as it, as it did when it was made and probably um, eons before that as well. And our, our, our interdependence, humanity's interdependence on um, the earth, we, co we are com commingled in a way with that material of, of earth. And it goes back to the creation myth of Adam and Eve and um, the idea that we are created um, from that earth. And, and that also, and I think the, the dish, the 17th century dish refers to the fact that we, we go back into that, that earth. But my exposure to uh, colonial uh, context and colonial ceramics through archeological material in this area, it was kind of, it coincides with the time frame of when the East opens up to the West. And so I'm, I'm just um, showing these two, two figures, these two contemporary artists who sort of represent that East meets West. They're, they're both rooted in um, uh, ceramics. They both began as ceramic artists, Ai Weiwei uh, on the, left and uh, dropping a, a Han Dynasty um, vase. And then uh, Grayson Perry, who's a, a British um, cross-dressing potter who uh, is now um, OBE. So it's, um, these are their respective works. So again, a, a sort of clobbered Han Dynasty, um, Western and, you know, icon, uh, Coca-Cola, uh, painted on this ancient Chinese pot. And then Grayson's uh, piece, which uh, takes a piece of imperial porcelain and um, reinterprets his own experience, his own life experience on it. And so, and it represents in a lot of ways to me what, um, what happens when the East opens in, to the West in the 16th century and the influence of our, these respective cultures on one another and the, in the Chinese porcelain coming into the Western world captivates the imagination of the West. But it also, um, Western culture was very influential um, in Asia. And, and to this day, these two pieces and these two artists represent that, that that, that um, legacy of colonialism is with us today. My exposure to those, the context of those pieces came through um, becoming aware of, again, these archeological ceramics. So a piece uh, like this Wanli Chinese cup, porcelain cup um, would be, exc was excavated at Jamestown in Virginia in the 1607 uh, outpost um, in amidst pieces like this, these different earthenwares and stonewares from uh, Germany and Portugal and the Netherlands and France and England. And the juxtaposition of those things was, you, you can see that the artifice of that porcelain object, um, how it would capture the imagination of the Western world, even though there were really sophisticated ceramic techniques. Um, these are more uh, arcane utilitarian type pieces, but of course, Western ceramics um, from ancient Greek uh, to uh, Majolica have incredible technical skills. Now, nonetheless, uh, Chinese porcelain sort of uh, changes the trajectory of Western ceramics for the next 200 years. But the context of those pieces in Virginia um, is really then illuminated by objects like this, which is um, uh, indigenous of Virginia Indian pot in the same 
in the same archaeological context. So we have Chinese, Chinese porcelain in the Western world and um, the indigenous populations of Virginia, all from you know, the ground beneath my feet in a place where I grew up that I didn't have any awareness of until my interest in ceramics. This piece is um, Virginia and the Chipstone Foundation collection. It's uh, something that kind of came out of my work on a film called The New World, but also about that subject, about the convergence of those cultures, about um, Western invasion into um, and settlement uh, and on indigenous lands and, and the legacy of that. Uh, so the, the Union Jack is in the form of the war paint on this sort of um, allegorical um, Native American bust. And I also was referencing a lot of depictions of um, the first depictions of um, Virginia Indians were sort of these romanticized and classicized um, figures. This is the uh, Debray engravings from the, the original John White watercolors. But there's also quite a bit of information and um, that you can glean from these images, even though they are subjective in a way that is and can be interpreted as very derogatory. The material culture in these images is saying something, is telling you something about um, the artifacts that, and the, the, the tattoos and the hairstyles and the things that um, we can understand from those depictions. This is um, Terra Nova. It's a piece that I was commissioned to uh, create an original artwork to be given to Queen Elizabeth um, on the 400th anniversary of the settlement of Jamestown. It's actually made from earth, from Jamestown, from the well and the fort settlement, and also um, clay from the Chickahominy River where there's a lot of um, ancient indigenous home sites. And it's Adam and Eve in this, in this sort of Garden of Eden idea. So the, post, the uh, composition of the temptation where the British crown and the cross thistle and, and rose are the um, serpent. I was asked once again um, to participate in an exhibition project that was um, to commemorate or to mark the 400th anniversary again of um, the British, you know, of the pil pilgrimage of the Mayflower. So the um, crossing of the Mayflower and settled in Patuxent, which is the ancient home of the Wampanoag uh, people, but uh, now known as Plymouth. This is Plymouth Rock on one side and and the and Split Rock, which is. Um, an ancient cultural landmark for the Wampanoag. The project had a, um, a premise to use, predominantly try to use um, period techniques and technology. Um, this is a wood fire, a five day wood fire kiln that I, um, participated in to, to finish the works that I created for that project. And I'm, I'm really only um, bringing this work up because it was one of a couple of projects I had going um, and then COVID hit. And this one in particular, um, it changed so many things for us all. Uh, and the projects that I was involved in seemed to be um, really um, changed by the advent of that taking place. And also the subject matter and the narratives of these um, projects were, in this case, the, the pandemic itself, the 400 years uh, since the, the pilgrimage to um, Plymouth and the settlement of that area and the displacement of all the, the indigenous people was preceded by a pandemic in 1619, which is why the shores were abandoned. And so it's, it's very relevant, I think, 
now uh, because that pain is being felt again, once again, uh, disproportionately by, um, by Native communities and First Nation communities across the country. This is Cauldron and it's the piece, um, one of the pieces I was firing in that um, five day wood fire kiln. It's made out of an indigenous uh, stoneware clay um, and it incorporates both industrial artifacts of fossil fuel industry and um, life cast uh, quahog and uh, scallop shell, lobster shell and cowrie shell. And all those have significant meaning. The, particularly the shells, the quahog shell and the um, scallop shell, scallop shell being a badge of Christian pilgrimage. Uh, and the quahog shell is the material of wampum, which is very culturally significant um, to indigenous people. But the invasion of um, the sort of the British <laughs> crown onto the shores of America and all the context of the ceramics have been excavated in this, um, these colonial excavations uh, are, are sort of a medium for me to um, basically bring it into our present moment and how, how that legacy connects to where we are today. Um, those commemorative uh, eight, uh, 17th century Delft uh, portrait um, cups of the British monarchy um, are still, you know, there's still some version of that. This is um, Harry and Meghan's uh, discount sale for <laughs> once they decided to leave the crown. But when that, um, when this paper came out, um, this piece was coming out of the kiln is when they announced that I, I immediately saw it as that sort of 21st century version of these monarch um, mugs that were being made in the 17th century. And this is the reverse. So it's, it's history it, to me is, it, in our present moment, our only our only knowledge of history is how we're looking at it in our present moment, and I and I do feel like um, that's the connective tissue for me, um, and why historical ceramics is so fascinating, especially uh, that during this period of Western expansion and invasion. This is a piece, Midnight Modern Conversation, another piece in the Chipstone Foundation collection. And it's, um, I, I like to draw on sometimes 18th century sat satirical engravings. This is from uh, William Hogarth's um, Midnight Modern Conversation. And this is a creamware version that I did. So this is all um, actually wheel thrown and hand modeled <clears throat> and put together. So even the figures are, the parts are thrown on the wheel. I made this back in the nineties, but again, it's, it's sort of like a pre COVID scene here, but you might be able to recognize some of your friends in the audience. Um, but I often um, draw on the, the sat 18th century satire, political satire. Um, this is uh, Hogarth. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> an engraving that Paul Revere ap appropriated. And um, it's essentially uh, a depiction of the assault on America. It's a pretty brutal political satire that um, I wanted to sort of transform into uh, my own version in 2000. And I started this in 2013, but this is my uh, transformation of that with a lot of key <clears throat> Republican and Tea Party figures that start, we're, we're really just beginning. But this uh, piece is also about, in Virginia, um, my version of the guy looking up Liberty's dress was our Lieutenant Governor in Virginia who was, uh, they were, they were trying to pass um, 
a law that required women to have a vaginal ultrasound prior to having an abortion. And we can see today where that was headed. And so this is really uh, about the, uh, the, the risk of women's rights in this country to this day. Here's another of Hogarth's um, engravings. This is John Wilkes, which you can tell from his cross eyes and his sort of devil shaped wig that Hogarth was not a big fan of, <laughs> of Wilkes. And I, I don't wanna, I'm not gonna talk, I wanna get to our, um, the exhibition Wild Porcelain, but I just wanted to give some background, some of the types of things that are not included in the exhibition. Um, that gives you some context for what, how the project evolved and developed. Um, but John Wilkes became a, a, a hero of the American Revolution, even though he was a Brit because he was, um, well, you can read for yourself. <laughs> So I had had Wilkes in mind for a long time. And when um, in 2015, when Trump started to um, seem serious about running for president, um, I began this series of uh, Trumped Up China. This is Trump Esquire. And this um, version is the back of that portrait. So it's sort of a cause and effect. It's uncanny that the, the um, similarities between these two. And if anybody wants to read more about this material on my website um, and the series that I've done, um, I, I don't wanna go too long on this, but one of the striking things once I started to make those connections is that you know Trump is uh, 45th president and John Wilkes was eventually in prison for his, um, the North Britain issue number 45, which became the rallying cry for the for the American Revolution. I think I've looked, I've seen um, and become aware over the course of my um, practice and my career of ceramics that document um, historical moments and also uh, that are used to communicate and advocate for a cause. And so I, um, when this phenomenon that um, began with Colin Kaepernick first sitting and then um, taking a knee uh, during the national anthem, it, it really struck me um, as an incredible historic moment. And partially potentially because of my awareness of the abolitionist medallion of Wedgwood fame. Again, um, this is just to, to contextualize um, the narrative of my work, but in um, the late 18th and early 19th century, ceramics were used to advocate for the abolition of slavery, and they also were um, used to advocate for the boycott of commodities that, that used uh, enslaved labor. So um, the force of that power is, is still something that we don't take advantage of, I think, as much as, as we should today. But um, it really had a lot to do with um, the eventual abolition of slavery. And this is Kaepernick and his campaign for Nike, who did step up as a corporation to, um, to allow uh, Kaepernick to, to speak out and you know, his First Amendment rights were being trampled on and he you know, sacrificed his career as a top athlete in the world. And this is a uh, Patriot Jug in the collection of Birmingham Museum of Art. So I like to bridge this connection. Um, this is a photograph by my partner, Ralph Hunter. We were in San Francisco some years ago. And um, it's, I've, I like to use it because it, it just is a, a good 
way of talking about um, perspective and also um, uh, bridging um, the past to the present moment. So I received an intriguing invitation. Um, uh, Philip and Jamie Bowles, when I was an uh, artist in residence at the Victorian Albert Museum in 2012, I received uh, a, an, a letter and a package of um, a, a book on this wonderful porcelain collection that is housed at the Legion of Honor, the Bowles Porcelain Gallery. And uh, Philip Bowles had seen something about my work and sent it to me at the VNA. And um, this is in their these this piece is in their private collection. They subsequently um, acquired. But I was contacted by Martin Chapman to um, see if I'd be interested in coming out, take a look at the collection, and um, potentially do an exhibition that responds to the porcelain collection in the Bowles Gallery. And these are some of the, the beautiful premier pieces in the collection, the, the perfume pot or the dove coat uh, is, a, is a remarkable piece. Um, the, the beautiful little apple boxes and artichoke boxes and the asparagus server and of course the pigeon terrine. And so I, I was compelled by this, not only the subject matter of um, the sort of natural flora and fauna of these pieces, uh, but also the, um, uh, the challenge of their um, sophisticated design and manufacture. And they were all used in elaborate dining rituals, which um, we still practice today, and this is uh, curator Martin Chapman. When we came out for a visit to the, it happened to be his birthday, and uh, he was being given a very intimate, very small little dinner uh, party and birthday party. But I also wanted to draw on the place where I, I, I found it curious that this um, assemblage um, home was in on the west coast you know on a hilltop over the bay overlooking the golden gate bridge and uh san francisco with its incredible um history and wealth and and uh, has become home to some of the you know the biggest and most influential tech companies and so I wanted to explore um, the area and bring that into the work that I was gonna develop. And again, we came out in February of 2020 and upon our return, the world literally changed. And um, I didn't know what the future of this exhibition project would be, um, but the seed was planted. So I kept it, I kept it going even though we weren't sure where it was going and when or if. Um, so these are just, uh, these are some of my original drawings and I wanted to uh, start to bring those things into the medium of porcelain. The Twitter birds I felt like uh, really kind of captured a lot of what, what, what you can see in the gallery, um, but decidedly very significant in 21st century iconography. Um, this kind of led me to looking into um, the Bay Area, the, the sort of environmental context of the Bay Area, and that, that led me to the, this idea of the restoration of the California condor. And so um, I, I just was following things where they, where they led, but what really compelled me about, um, look, about knowing more about this and having seen a pair of California condors when we were driving down the PCH one time, it was kind of interesting to have that come 
full circle. I actually took a picture of those. But the hand, the humanity involved in the restoration of, of that majestic bird and one that, that human endeavors had jeopardized was just something that was very compelling as well. It's um, you know something that requires our our care and our humanity to restore. This is my studio, and I'm working on uh, the the baby condor again. That this original model is just wheel thrown and, and manipulated. But this is the kind of environment that I might be working in. Well, I'll have all the images of the things that I'm thinking about and looking at around uh, my wheel and um, just working from all these various images to sort of create uh, an amalgamation of those things. And this project, you, you can't help but visit the Legion of Honor and the, you know, be taken with the incredible Rodin collection there as well. And I, I didn't realize maybe initially I was, I was uh, enjoying seeing those pieces, but um, they did, I think, come back into um, the project that was a, really a direct response to the Bowles Porcelain Gallery. But these maquettes, um, these Rodin maquettes kind of must have been in my subconscious. And um, these uh, wild porcelain maquettes that you saw in the video, this, this material that comes right out of the ground, um, as a porcelainous clay, it's pretty difficult to work with. Um, and it required really, it, it was, it's best used as, um, as slip casted and, and press molded. And so it influenced the entire way that I uh, developed this work and developed these maquettes for the larger works um, because it was, it, was not, it was not conducive. But it, it was then you know, subjected to this um, wood fire, five day wood fire kiln with very little glaze or anything on the surface. So some of these, pro these pieces in the, in the um, exhibition I kind of evolved from things that I've been um, working on for some time. Um, and when the uh, deep, when we had the deep water spill in the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico. I, don't, I can't remember what year that was, but I'd had my eye on these BP signs that have some relief to them. Uh, now they're all sort of a decal of the BP Helios, but um, there's a few places um, where these older signs were that I was always keeping my eye out. And I, I saw a for sale sign on one of the um, gas station lots and I just called to see if I could somehow get the sign. And they said, you can have it if you, you know, you can pay somebody to take it down. So I hocked myself up and um, got this sign. And it, the, the piece in the show is the first actual translation, literal translation, physical translation of this 10 foot BP sign into a very small, delicate porcelain box and dish. And the bottom uh, slide is, um, Dr. Bernard Means from the Virtual Curation Lab at VC, Virginia Commonwealth University, who I've collaborated with to do a lot of 3D scanning and um, printing and some design work uh, for the pieces in the show. And so he's scanning that um, BP sign there. And he also was scanning my original artworks um, so that they would also be recorded three dimensionally, which is, uh, Pretty great, especially if you're working in ceramics because you can, you can lose a piece, even though I'm reluctant to ever say that, it, it can happen. And so it was kind of interesting to have, of course, it's a very different thing once it's been scanned and printed in a plastic material, and you have to do something with it to retranslate it back into clay. But these are um, the, the 3D models of some of the pieces that you'll see in the show. Um, the center is a, a replica condor skull that I, a uh, California condor skull that I purchased. And that's my arm and, and hand in a, in a rubber glove. 
holding the skull and a, a sort of a cylinder of clay. So he was able to scan that and print it so it could actually be my hand. Now, and the, uh, the BP Helios was, um, we turned that into a globe. And then the trans angel um, is uh, sort of a convergence of the Trans America building and some Civil War um, gravestones that came from Richmond, Virginia. And these are some of the, what I had um, designed and made into transfer prints. So, so a lot of the imagery are, uh, have to be made into uh, images, decals basically, or transfers that can be applied to the ceramic surface and fired. So they're, they're made out of uh, ceramic material. Ink would just burn off in the kiln. And of course there's all the tech app iconography, um, the COVID, there's the mission butterfly and the uh, San Francisco garden, gardener snake that are endangered species in the Bay Area. And then I also incorporated um, the tents of, of the homeless or the unhoused that has um, been a real issue in the Bay Area, but of course, across the country. And I kind of saw that as the disenfranchised, as the, as the um, endangered part of our humanity. And here's the Helios box and dish. And the, the emblem, uh, you know, the, the icon of the fossil fuel industry and the geopolitics of, of fossil fuels and also the um, ramifications that we're all seeing in climate change, again, are um, endangering species and also threatening indigenous peoples and disproportionately. And many of the wealthy, the most rich resources of um, mining and fossil fuels are on indigenous lands. And they're also you know, the, the thing that sometimes supports the tribes um, uh, along with other things like casinos. So it, it's um, referenced here in this deer antler and um, as something that was, is so significant culturally and to their, their food ways. So the Twitter birds cast in the wild porcelain, which again comes directly uh, out of, comes, the clay is, just comes straight out of the ground that way. And um, fired, again, the one is on uh, a fossil, a Jeffersonian, you know, scallop shell, a big fossil shell that I took a life cast from the others on a, a piece of wood. So they have, I wanted to kind of uh, juxtapose this, these, these very sort of artificial toy-like, cartoon-like um, icons of the tech industry with all this extremely natural, um, you know, earth and fire and um, elements, natural elements. This is the unloading of the kiln. This is actually what it looks like uh, when you're taking the pieces out of the kiln. At uh, This is uh, artist David Stumpley in Seagrove, North Carolina, and I've collaborated with him in these wood firing kilns. And um, so the pots come out and they go, they go in the grass. And so the grass gets filled up with all these incredible pots, not mine, but theirs, they're, they're beautiful. And it, it was um, kind of the inspiration too. I wanted to um, have that sort of natural green, that landscape, but at artifice. And, and that was picked up on in the display. So this is um, baby door in uh, juxtaposition to the, um, the pigeon terrine. And it's interesting, all the, the, the incredible, um, amount of work that not only, and, and steps that are in this, this piece, not only in my piece, but in the original piece. These are very um, sophisticated objects that uh, 
you know, these English porcelains were uh, very elite production. There was artists, you know, um, top artists involved in design of, of some of these um, wares. And then you have the whole element of the medium of ceramics, which requires um, so much technology. Te and so they were very cutting edge, sophisticated technology and they were produced for a very elite market. Uh, so it was very socially uh, upper class um, dining rituals that incorporated these pieces. But one thing I noticed is it, as I don't know who, whoever's watching me, maybe uh, if you're an artist, it's sort of like the eyes are the last thing you do and they're almost the most important thing. So how my, however much work goes into these things, it all comes down to the, to the eyes on these objects. And I noticed um, in the um, images of the puppets that they were using to feed the baby condor, which so it's a, it is a human hand. I've taken some liberties with how that <laughs> that works, but um, but they'd have a, a glass eye in those puppets that really mimic the the adult condor, mother condor. These studio photographs are my partner, Rob Hunter. I just want to acknowledge that. So Trans Angel um, sort of evolved, uh, but it out of um, all the images I've sort of shown about the in interest I was um, in the area itself and those things that are specific to the Bay Area, but are you know, universal concerns. And um, one of the things I think that's pretty evident is and that's been uncovered by COVID uh, even more so is the, the inequities, the wealth inequities and the consequences of those things. And so that's clearly um, part of this, this narrative where um, you sort of have the rainbow row at the bottom and you have um, some of the, the tents and uh, of the unhoused underneath as the footing of this piece, but you also have these these um, tech icons traveling up the piece up to the pinnacle, and I think you know it's it's an expression of how much the, a part of our lives these icons have become, and how incredibly powerful and influential. Um, these companies are over not only our collective lives, uh, but on a very personal level. So these are some of the elements um, and the sort of connections between this, the um, dovecote and the trans angel. And here you have, the, uh, one thing I like about all these porcelain pieces, you always have this sort of frozen in time, you know, you have this, this fox menacing at the bottom you know, waiting uh, for this this pigeon or dove um, on the branch above, but it's it's sustained in that time, and so there's sort of ever the fruits and vegetables are are ever fresh, and uh, the worm on the apple just stays where it is. So um, ceramics is like that, and and I like the idea that um, because it doesn't. It can break apart and it can, you know, be fractured, but it doesn't disappear. And that's that's one of the things about archaeological ceramics. It's a it's a record of us. It's a record of who we are. These are some details of that piece, and I wanted to just. It's a little bit hard to tell, but um, I threw the original, uh, I modeled these Twitter birds in much larger size. And it was because I was able to make use of my colleague that could um, scan and then 3D print these in smaller sizes. And then I could take those and make plaster molds that then could be cast in porcelain. So that's the, the process of that. But the 3D printing itself has a physical language and you can see that language a little bit in the wing. It creates a very, and in this, in the um, spire, um, this very intricate network of um, 
filament is being built up in specific patterns. And it, those patterns are, are basically a nuisance to the uh, majority of uses of 3D printing and are usually removed. But I like to exploit them and, and enhance them in any way that I can because they're completely, uh, there's no other way to get those surfaces. And um, they're also just a, a, a snapshot of this technological moment. I had started this piece, um, this portrait of Greta Thunberg, the, of course, the child uh, climate change activist who um, addressed, the, the portrait is from her address to the UN. And um, when I saw that, it reminded me so much of this um, pretty famous, oh, by the way, in the, in the video, I say bow porcelain, this is a Chelsea porcelain um, piece that was um, created by a, a French artist and designer, Rebilliac, and then um, produced at the Chelsea porcelain factory. And I immediately wanted to um, translate that to a portrait of what I thought was an incredible, um, incredibly important and brave action when she was calling out world leaders and they, just the juxtaposition in my mind of you know this sort of carefree, joyous expression on this 18th century um, young child's face and then um, an expression of literally the weight of the world on this young girl's shoulders and her, and her um, charge to try to do something about that. And um, it wasn't until Martin, um, I talked to him about including this piece, even though the Bowles collection does not, and uh, doesn't have, um, one of these Chelsea porcelain busts. Um, he said, oh, well, have you seen the mural? And I was like, no, what mural? So that, I, I didn't know about the mural in San Francisco, but that kind of cinched it that we should include this piece in the exhibition. The asparagus, server or asparagus box in the collection is again something that visually kind of um, spoke to me. I was doing a series of these impressions of, of bullets, um, making molds of these um, bullet impressions and pressing the clay into the bullets and these rows and rows of bullets. And even though um, it doesn't necessarily look similar to me in, in my head, I made that connection and I wanted to uh, continue a series that I've done on gun culture and gun violence in America um, and use this server. This actually is a vessel, so the, the hand opens and it's a, it's a small serving piece. And here it is here. But again, the influence and just in the last, Unfortunately, a couple of weeks we've seen um, another very tragic instance of this gun violence and, and a really heightened frustration about trying to prevent this. But I, I, feel, I feel like the intimacy of the scale of these serving pieces and the fact that these um, that gun violence has come into our most intimate spaces, you know, into our houses and dinner tables and, and um, into our schools. And I felt like the, the overall um, context of these serving pieces kind of lent themselves to the subject matter because they would be used in those kinds of environments. So I wanted to just, I was um, uh, 
uh, honored with being the cover collaboration for the British Decorative Arts issue number 21 um, and the British Art Studies um, publication. And so they featured uh, an article by me and with a majority of which further discusses this project and um, wild porcelain. So I hope you guys will um, also go to that and read more about um, and some other incredible, um, it's edited by Iris Moon, who's the um, decorative arts curator at the Met. And um, it's, it's just a, a really great issue. And I think um, people who, if, if you're interested in what I was in, in my approach and what I'm doing with my art, I think you'd be really interested in that, in the entire issue 21 of the British Art Studies. So I hope you'll go to that and have a look. And I appreciate whoever stuck with us this long. <laughs> and if you and if you didn't, I don't blame you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, I have certainly gained uh, a new appreciation for how thoughtfully your pieces relate to the Bay Area and to this particular moment in time. Um, unfortunately, I fear we don't have time for questions, um, but it has been such a pleasure for all of us at the Fine Arts Museums to work with you on this exhibition, and we are so grateful to have your work on view in the Bulls Porcelain Gallery. I encourage our audience members to visit the Legion of Honor and see Michelle's very thought-provoking work. Uh, this concludes our program, and we thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much to Michelle Erickson and Thomas Wu. What a wonderful and engaging presentation. Michelle Erickson, Wild Porcelain is on view now at the Legion of Honor. Please check out our website and book tickets in advance. Tickets.famsf.org, tickets.famsf.org. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and we hope to see you next time.